the organizers asked me to give a brief overview of astroparticle physics. And I noticed that this conference is all about astroparticle physics. So I guess what I'll be talking about will, should be like a sneak preview of what will be covered in the later talks. Sneak preview means what we call trailer here. So the full movies will follow. I'll just cover some basic things, where some new, some signals, they got small, which may have some new physics in them. So I'll start with this measurement of antiproton by AMA02. And what was noticed in this loop was, is that there is a signal for dark matter of mass. Uh, so what's plotted here is some flux times the rigidity, so some power, and the rigidity. So the rigidity is, uh, if you want the momentum, you multiply by the charge of the proton, point D. So this is the rigidity. And over here is the plot. And the bump is not this one, actually somewhere here. So if you take the experiment and divide by the theory, or subtract the theory, what you see is the bump here. And this, if you put in a dark matter component, so a dark matter which has a mass of between 80 to 40 to 80 GeV, and it has a cross section of what correct for the relic density, and it goes to BB bar, that will give you this, this bump. Then the, the agreement with this com contribution to the theory, the agreement is better between theory and experiment. Now you may think that this is a very underwhelming evidence here, but uh, it was good enough for the editors of PRL to take note, so maybe there is something here. Uh, one thing different between uh, the AMS antiprotons and AMS positron signals, where there is a big dif difference between uh, the theory, the secondaries from the cosmic rays, and what's seen is that uh, there are no antiprotons produced in pulsars, so there is no astrophysical source of this. So the uncertainty can be only in the secondary, in the calculation of the secondary production from the primary cosmic rays. So here in this paper, there was a more detailed look at the secondary production of antiprotons from the primary cosmic rays. And so this is this, this is the dash, this is the theoretical prediction, and this is the AMS. According to this paper, there is a two sigma discrepancy between the theory and the experiment, which may be a signal of dark matter. So again, coming back to those two PRL papers, they put together this cross section of referring to BB bar and mass, and they also put in place the took into account the gamma ray coming from the galaxy. So the exclusion is this one. So anything above that is excluded, but this, the one which gives you the signal of the antiproton is there. Now there is some tension between these two are the exclusion limits from gamma rays coming from parallel galaxies. So there is, they say that there is some tension between this gamma ray coming from parallel galaxies and the gamma uh, and the antiproton signal, but there is some evidence according to Okay, so this is what antiproton measurement from uh, AMS02. AMS02 also saw anti-helium and boron to carbon ratio. And so this, this is the one thing which there may be a hint of uh, dark matter. Okay, so next I'll move on to another uh, experiment where I think there is a, I mean, a more compelling uh, evidence for some new physics. So this is the ice cube neutrino measurement, which goes from 100 GV to PV scale. And so the low energy is created by this neutrinos, which come from the atmosphere. So this is the shaded, this colored region is from the atmosphere. And then there is a component which is coming from Astrophysical that is outside our atmosphere. So this has two possible, so they are taking two possible slopes. One is this dashed one, and a little more 
steep slope which is so what is noticed here is that these are the two pev events one one so two one pev event and one two pev event and here over here this bump in the theoretical cross section is because of the glacial resonance that if you have a new e bar the electron in the ice will produce a real w and the decay of the real w will give you a big signal so what is seen here is that if you take this steep slope you are okay with the non observation of the glacial resonance okay so the glacial resonance is observed is zero and these are the error bars so if you take a steep slope you can explain that why we don't see the glacial resonance but you sort of miss the pv events on the other hand if you choose the slope which is e to the minus 2 okay, this one you are okay with the glacial re resonance no, or the non observation of the glacial resonance no sorry you are okay with the with the pv neutrino events you can explain that but then you go over the error bar in the why you don't see glacial resonance so there is some sort of a tight fit here between theory and experiment that either you explain this or you explain that in the standard some people also mentioned that uh, there is a gap here between 400 PV to 1 PV. Okay. Nothing seen here, but that may be just statistics. <clears throat> now, so the new physics which people propose is that there is a room for a bump here, a, a new signal which can give rise to this. So you can have this, this slope and added to that a bump in the uh, new signal which will give you these two PEV. Now, before I go on to that bump, just a quick, just think about one idea why, which will explain your, why you do not see the glacial resonance. So this is the glacial resonance, that this is your charge current with the nu on the nucleon and this is if you produce a real W with a new E bar. So clearly what we have to explain is why there are no new E bars in the in the flux of neutrinos in ice cube. And one simple idea is that the neutrinos, the three, if they are have a inverted hierarchy and they all decay to nu three, then the nu E component of nu three is small because u E three is small. So the nu E component of that neutrino would be small. So a neutrino decay to the third mass eigenstate in a inverted hierarchy would explain why you do not why the paucity of anti-electron neutrinos in ice cube. Now for explanation of this 1 and 2 PeV ice cube neutrino, there are various things. So I'll just there are lots of papers and I'll just mention the one the local ones. So you can have a dark matter of a few PeV and the decay of that dark matter with this lifetime will give you the adequate flux to explain, will give you a new source of this PeV neutrinos. And the decay need not be only to neutrinos, it can be another particle which can scatter your nucleons and then give you the shower events that you have seen. So this is one way to get a signal that is produce a high, get a high energy component from a decay. Another way is that you, from the standard neutrinos that are coming in from the astrophysical sources, you produce resonantly some particle by scattering over nuclei. So one good example is leptoquarks. If you have Q, nu with the Q will give you a leptoquark resonantly produced, which when decays will give you the ice cube events. So examples of this leptoquark models which will give you this, this explain this one or two PEV events are here in these papers. Uh, one interesting possibility is apart from the leptoquarks is that if you have R parity violating SUSY, then if you take this LQDC, uh, that uh, R parity violating op operator, then you can with the quark, uh, the neutrino and a quark will produce a squark and that if the squark mass is here, then you will get a signal at ice cube. But perhaps this 
the energy, the mass range of the quarks that you need this is probably ruled out now by LHC. Unless you have a very constrained model like a you know, compressed SUSY where the mass difference between various particles is smaller than MW. But probably the light SUSY models may not explain LHC. So one reason why you can have a, I mean, if you have a dark matter whose uh, decay gives you the ice cube, this thing would be that the dark matter, the, if you look at the ice cube events and point it back to the source to the extent possible, then there should be more towards uh, correlation between the direction from which these neutrinos are coming and the density of dark matter. And in this paper, they did a sort of correlation study and they say that there is a positive correlation between the dark matter density in the galaxy and the high energy neutrinos which are coming from high energy. So there may be some evidence that these are of dark matter origin. Now I, I mentioned that uh, this uh, SUSY model which explains ice cube to a resonant production of a spark. This depends upon the low energy, uh, low, you know, the low scale SUSY where the sparks are less than a TV mass. Uh, another possibility, if you, if the low scale SUSY is ruled out or the sparks are not seen up to that much, another possibility is that you take a PV scale SUSY. So here's a model which was constructed by Najimuddin and so I'll just show you some calculations that he has. So, here you have a decay, so you have a bino which is some 5 PV which is the dark matter whose decay through a R parity violating operator can give you neutrinos. So you'll have two components, one is the cosmological neutrinos which is this purple shaded and one is the galactic neutrinos which are coming from the same decay. Now the galactic neutrinos would have higher energy because they are closer, so the, these ones are red shifted so I have less energy. So you, you should see a correlation between the galactic dark matter and the high energy neutrinos. So this is a model where you have a high, high scale SUSY and R parity violation will give you your. So this is the full model and so you have all the, so if you start with the, at the gut scale, these parameters and do your RG, you will get the spectrum and the Higgs mass can give, can be tuned can be obtained with of course very high level of uh, fine tuning. So what you lose in this model is of course naturalness that you do not have a naturalness for explaining the light haze. But what you get is some dark matter signal plus what you get is this uh, coupling constant unification. So if you turn on this SUSY spectrum at PV scale then you will have a unification where otherwise you would not. So there is something to say for this PV scale SUSY which is unnatural that you are getting a Higgs mass by fine tuning but it, it gives you other good things like dark matter and which explain your ice cube and also coupling constant unification. Okay, so now I will move to this discovery of this gravitational waves. Now this gravitational wave there are three events, this one came last week. Okay, and so these are the gravitational waves which have been seen at different distances. So this is about 410 megaparsec, this is 440 megaparsec and this is 818 megaparsec. So the point about this is that okay, the, what you learn from here is the physics of the inspiraling binary and also from this you get a, the gravitational waves propagate and from the fact that there is no stretching of the signal is not, the signal is not dispersed, you get a bound on the graviton mass. But one thing you can ask is that uh, can this say something about the medium which is the dark matter, the gravitational waves passing through a medium would have some, should have some consequences which would give you something about the property of the medium. But unfortunately in GR, if you take the medium which has this normal ideal fluid type of 
test answer with any relation between P and Q. Okay, any kind, it can be chapter in gas, it can be dark energy, dark matter, whatever. So, if you have a normal fluid or ideal fluid, then there is no there is no absorption or dispersion of gravitational waves. So this is a very old result. It was established in more very general circumstance conditions. So there is no going around it. However, if you change this nature of this test answer and add shear viscosity, I mean bulk viscosity, then it was seen many papers I think earlier was Hawking that the shear viscosity has the effect of damping of the gravitational waves. So, shear visco if your medium has a non-zero shear viscosity, the gravitational waves passing through it would absorb the gravitational wave and the gravitational wave would be exponentially damped. So, this was revived again in this paper that this would be a way to look for the shear viscosity and that would be could be a property of the dark matter. So, there is some calculation of so, this is your wave equation and this uh, shear is caused by the passing gravitational waves. So, if you put that here, you will get a damped equation for the gravitational wave and the solution would be something like this. So, you have this one h which goes as a upon r normally, you will have an exponential factor which depends upon your shear viscosity. So, now the point is that uh, the expected amplitude can be calculated from measuring this frequency and the chirp mass which is uh, which can be determined by measuring the frequency and the change in the frequency. So, by doing analysis of the frequency series in uh, time series how the frequency changes you can establish a naught, but what is not this is there is a degeneracy in this 1 by r and this extra factor unless you know the r you cannot determine this factor. So, one needs a independent determination of the source of this gravitational wave that means there has to be seen in some other electromagnetic or neutrino channel which will establish this r and once you establish this r then you can calculate this exponential factor and work out this. So, right now the bound on shear viscosity, so this is a projected bound not a real bound in the sense that what we say is that if you had this gravitational wave and you could predict the r to let us say 1 percent accuracy, then this factor would be 0 0.01 and that will give you eta of this in high energy unit GeV cube and this is in Pascal second. So, this would be some sort of a you know the very ideal measurement, if you have a very good measurement at some time you can get eta of this magnitude. So, what does it say about dark matter? Well, you can connect easy the shear viscosity to the self interaction of a dark matter. So, if you have a so the eta is related to this number density the velocity RMS velocity and the mean free path which is again the number density and the self interaction cross section. So, the number density cancels and you get a this eta is related to the mass divided by the cross section. So, the mass divided by the cross section or the sigma by m either way gives you the shear viscosity. So, if you take this shear viscosity so sigma by m which is I will explain a little more. This is the number which is coming out from analysis of uh, the structure of galaxies and clusters. Sigma by m for this self interacting dark matter is something like 1 centimeter square by gm, which is 2 bun per gv. So, if you have that large cross section, then this eta is 10 to the 6 Pascal second, which is somewhat in the same range as this. So, a good measurement of gravitational wave with the amplitude with the known uh, source or the source distance can measure the self interaction sigma by m of your SIDM. So, this SIDM is was invoked to solve this uh, core cusp and missing satellite problems which are there in the lambda CDM model. 
and there are other ways in you can also evade this forecast. Forecast problem is that uh, in the center of the galaxy, you expect a cusp from the simulation, but you will see a chord distribution. Chord means that it's hollowed, that means there are less density at the core, at the center. And also, the predicted number of satellite galaxies are not observed. So, the way to solve this problem is, as I mentioned, is this S. Huh? What do you mean by serious? So, I'll show you a plot. I'll show you actual plot and then. So, uh, you, so you have to get rid of uh, this uh, high density dark matter somehow. So one way to do in, in this is that in the infall, what you expect you do is that you make the cross section or the time scattering time to be of like 10 giga, giga years, which is the life of a galaxy, which means the particle will at least uh, scatter once before it goes to the center, which means it will, the accumulation in the center is depleted. And that number actually leads to this. So that sort of evades the problem of the accumulation in the center. But there are other theories also. There's a warm dark matter where you have a free streaming, so it will take the, the mass out from the center and spread it outside. The fuzzy dark matter, that is very ultralight dark matter, whose Compton wavelength is the size of the galaxy and some more. Well, concentrate on this particular one. So, here is an example of observation. So, if you take this self-interaction, and so what will happen is that this would be your distribution. It will become this distribution, core distribution. That means it will be depletion in the center. And with this depletion in the center, what will happen is that the velocity rotation curves will change from here to this one. And this seems to be the one which the data favor. So you, this is a very, this, I, I took this plot from this paper. So they have done a very exhaustive analysis of in various settings. So this would be your, the gain that you get from getting a self-interacting dark. Yes, it's like a nucleon nucleon scattering cross section, yeah. But it is only a self interaction of the dark matter, not dark matter scattering other stuff. You have to have a light mediator, basically, to get that, that kind of cross section. Well, it can have contact with the visible world of the weak interaction cross section. But the self interaction has to be large. Yeah, so interesting enough that this number actually the same number also comes from bullet cluster. It also comes from an analysis of the Abel cluster. So there are many analysis of these clusters which all lead to the same number. Upper bound on the cluster. But this Abel cluster analysis tells you that the distribution of the mass is such that this there is there is uh, so it, that also depends upon the observation of the X-rays from this Abel cluster. It tells you how the mass is distribution. Yes, it will still have the separation. What? It is one bond per GeV. So 10 to the minus 24 centimeter square per GeV. The bound comes from the upper bound, like you are saying, comes from the bullet cluster. Uh, this is actually, you see, if you take this, put this, this is a requirement which fits the data well. <coughs> and interesting enough, all these numbers are, are around this. So this is the number to shoot for in a model for SIDM. And you can so this large cross section, like you are all asking, is if you have a light mediator. So MEV mediator would. So this was the point I connected with this uh, measurement of uh, GW waves is that the viscosity 
that you can measure corresponds to this cross section sigma by m which is of the same order which is needed for this. So, yes, yes. So, there is a, I am aware of this paper where it says there is no problem of this core cusp for satellite galaxies. It's true. So, well. So, for whatever it's worth, uh, if there is a core cusp problem or a satellite problem, so if there is a discrepancy between the lambda CDM and the observations, then this is a way to evade it and you can measure then the self interaction through this absorption of gravitation. But this actually, uh, this self interaction actually comes in, in many places, in the galactic structure and also in the clusters. So, and the same number is used in both, which is the interesting thing. Yeah, the elastic scatter. Yeah. So basically, you prevent an infall during the lifetime of a galaxy, it should scatter once. And similarly, for the cluster, the mean free path should be the size of the cluster. Both the numbers give you the same. Only elastic. Oh yeah, so you are saying that, yeah, you should not produce a light particle which will take energy out. That's correct. So in that sense, you should not have a dissipative process that will take energy out of the system. Okay, so, okay, then I'll move to inflation models and what they can say about our particle physics. So, this is a plot of this tensor to scalar ratio and the primordial tilt of the scalar spectrum. And so, there is now a very good bound. I think the number for this tensor to scalar ratio is something like 0.07, that is the upper limit. And uh, found on this NS is this do this thing over here. So, most of the inflation models, the power law and m square and pi to the 4, etc., are ruled out, except for a few, like natural inflation and this uh, Starobinsky model, R square inflation. So, let me just say that supposing you want to construct a model of inflation which gives you a very small tensor to scalar ratio, what particle physics models can you get? There is no particle physics model, this is a gravity model. So, the Starobinsky model tells you that if you add a R square term with a very large coefficient, you see this m, 1 by m square, m is 10 to the minus 5. So, you have a very large coefficient on this R square term. Then, unlike in GR, the, among the 10 modes of your graviton, some will be actually the physical modes and one of those modes will be one of the scalar modes will, if you can, you can make a transformation from this frame, make a conformal transformation, you get back in the new metric, just the R term, okay. I should have put a tilde over this G and this thing, but this is a new metric. Then you will get some extra terms which are actually the graviton degrees of freedom. And what this conformal transformation gives you is that in the scalar, if you interpret this in the scalar sector as a scalar, then you will get this kind of potential and this is the plateau potential, I will show you the shape, it gives you a very good inflation. Now, because of the flatness of the plateau, your, if you fix the scalar amplitude, <coughs> your scalar amplitude as is delta phi square upon phi dot and the phi dot is small, then your delta phi square is small, that means the value of the potential is small to fit the scalar amplitude, which then if your amplitude of the potential is small, then you get small tensor. So, the smallness of tensor is related to the flatness of this potential and the slow roll of this. Similarly, you can have a Higgs inflation model where you have this Higgs. And normally, if you just have a lambda at phi to the 4 model, it will be ruled out because you have a, <coughs> this lambda of the Higgs is 0.1, whereas if you want to create inflation from this quartic potential, you need lambda of 10 to the minus 12. But if you put a coupling here and then of the Higgs with the curvature and then go to a frame where this, this thing is taken out, that is uh, transformed to a Einstein frame where you have only the R term, 
then you'll get exotic terms in your potential and this is the form of the potential. So in both these, in this transformation there are two steps involved. One is that when you make a transformation, okay, you create some kinetic terms of non-canonical form and then you have to make a, another transformation which will make the kinetic term canonical and then that will give you the potential of the new field of this form. So after all these steps you get back this uh, sort of a plateau potential and here the only lacuna of this model is that the, the coupling that you need is very large. So this leads to non unitarity in the graviton graviton scattering for instance, if you have a this large this thing much below the Planck scale. So that is some sort of a problem with these models also the this in the Starobinsky model this mass is rather large 10 to the 10 which is hand unexplained. So, so this is a plateau potential yeah yeah <coughs> yes that's right yes yes I should have mentioned that that if you run the lambda it will become negative at 10 to the uh, 10 to the 10 GV or so in standard model and that is also there even if you put in this R coupling okay, that is not same. So there is a Higgs instability problem in the Higgs. So that is actually the lacuna of this Higgs inflation model. Thank you. <coughs> phi. Phi is the H when you make a canonical transformation you will get some non-canonical kinetic term. Then you make another transformation to phi where the canonical the kinetic term is canonical and then the new field is your that phi. No, no, same, same type of same story that phi is related to the derivative of r square. So, it is, it is a, it is related to r. So, again you make your canonical transformation. So, this degree of freedom contained in r is the phi, there is no field added. So, that is the nice thing about the Starvinsky model that it, you do not add a, another scalar field. The graviton degree of freedom is your phi. <coughs> okay, so this is the plateau inflation which you have to shoot for. You need a flat uh, roll in to get a small r. Yeah, this is Planck unit. Thank you. Yeah, well that, that is the thing which people debate that your Planck, the field is super Planckian because to get enough E folding, you want 50 E foldings, you cannot avoid the super Planckian rolling of the field. Okay. But the energy density is the gut scale. So this is 10 to the 16 GV to the power 4. So, I mean, in that sense, the energy is not super Planckian, even the field excursion is super Planckian. Okay, so I guess one way you can phrase this is that supposing you have field, you write it as a corrections one by M Planck suppression and you write all the higher order terms, right? Then you, yeah, but I'm talking. Yes. No, this m is just a dimensionless number over here. So this has dimension 4. No, 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 it is not 10 to the minus 5 m Planck. This r square has dimension 4. So this is just 10 to the minus 5. Yeah, you can do that. But if you just take each operator dimension 4, then this r square is dimension 4 and what you all you are doing is multiplying by a dimensionless number of order 10 to that. So what is the problem here is that you have a large coupling 10 to the plus 5. So when you have a graviton graviton scattering that will diverge at much lower energy than the Planck scale even at the tree level. Yes, correct, absolutely yes. Yes, so that, that there is a lacuna in this theory, that is correct. That is correct, yes. Yes, because okay, so you are saying that the moment you have a very large coupling, loops will give you a divergent much less than the Planck scale. That's probably yeah, yeah, we can discuss this. 
Okay. So, yeah, there, there is a problem in this large this thing in the loops, but uh, in uh, the field excursion can be super Planckian. That, that's, that cannot be avoided in the, so there is something called the lithe bound, which relates the E folding number to the field excursion, and that's independent of the model. So, you have to have phi of the Planck scale, unless of course it's running, there's a small field model which comes from 0 to which have less than Planck, but they are all in the Planck units. Uh, no, this lambda, which lambda? This, this thing actually is your potential that goes into, your, not the E folding, but this fits your delta T by T or the temperature anisotropy. So, the, once you fix that and your NS and R are from the number of E foldings. So, this is uh, just from the fact that delta T by T is 10 to the min minus 5. That gives you. Okay. So, okay. So, this is, uh, so we have some exotic uh, gravity coupling, which uh, as I've been pointed out has some problems. In, when you try to even at the tree level scattering, there are problems of unitarity much below the Planck scale if you have these large couplings. So, one way out is to find something else where you don't have this and this is a thing which I will just, uh, I lead on to this paper of John Ellis and, and collaborators. So, what they do is they get this kind of uh, plateau inflation from the Sugra model and I know they are aware that there is a full talk about this, so I will not cover full details, but I will just mention the idea and I also mention some of the local papers on this. So, in Sugra, so the aim is to get the same sort of plateau inflation from a different sector, which is natural in particle physics, which is supersymmetry, supergravity. So, you have a Keller potential, which is a, and a super potential. So, you have to supply a in your theory, you have to supply a holomorphic function which is singlet under your symmetry of the theory and you have to supply a real function which is a Keller potential and with these two things, when you put these two things, your theory is set and then you can work out the details. So, the crucial point here is that the kinetic term depends upon the derivatives of this Keller potential. So, if you have a non-zero Keller potential, that means more than quadratic terms, then you will get a non-kinetic, uh, non-canonical kinetic term and this non-canonical kinetic term then when you transform the fields to kinetic, uh, to make it canonical will give you this plateau potential. So, that is the trick in this. So, from the potential from those can, uh, the scalar potential and the super potential you can calculate the scalar potential, the F term and this is in case of gauge coupling of the field you have this D term. So, with all that, this is the paper where the Sugra model gives you the same kind of plateau inflation that uh, Starobinsky model does. So, you have this extra fields which are in the no scale form, which means that when they take a web, they do not appear in the potential. That means, Sugra breaking does not affect your the potential, not contribute to the potential. So, you can have zero value of the potential and still break Sugra at for any value of t. And so, this is the Keller potential and this is your super potential. So, this is a standard West Zumino super potential. So, there is only one caveat that this mu term and lambda term which are normally not related in uh, Sugra models or SUSY models have a fine relation in order to give you the correct inflation. So, if you work out the kinetic term and the potential term, what you will find is that your kinetic term gives you this and your potential term is some complicated form which term and if you make your a transformation from phi to chi, it will make this canonical, this term kinetic, term canonical. Now, C is the wave of your T, T plus T star. So, this is taken to be the Planck scale. Now, <clears throat> with this you get this very fine uh, plateau potential in a rather simple West Zumino type of 
to the model. So, the only caveat is that this lambda by mu has to be fixed as 1 by 3 to give you this. If you change this by a small amount, of course, you go up and down. And if you go up and down, what you do is you tilt the scalar spectrum. So, you come out of the, you become ns larger or smaller. You do not lift it to get a larger value of r. So, one of the aims, like why do you want to keep doing this kind of thing is that if you have a Darobinsky inflation, which is giving you this point, one of the aims is that if you can have this kind of model, Sugra models and tinker with it, you can get a larger value of r, something like 0.5 or 0.7. And that would be something which can be, is testable in the upcoming experiment. So, whereas this Sarobinsky model is very restrictive, it gives you r of 10 to the minus 3, which will never be measured. So, a realistic Sugra model, which will give you a larger r, or at least r within the bounds, would be a good idea. And this, this is the, one of the way to. So, there are lots of papers which have followed this idea. And I just mentioned some of the local ones. So, here, the same trick was done for this SO10 representation. So, you take the scalars of the SO10. So, these are the three scalars. And you take the directions which do not break MSSM. So, it can break to different Pati Salam or flipped SU5. But you do not, the, you take pick directions in the field which do not break your Pati Salam. So, you have the same T plus T star with some singlets of these fields. And then after you pick your directions, what you will should get is a square term and a cubic term in your potential and the super potential of this form. And <clears throat> okay, so this was done and the same type of relation that uh, same plateau inflation was recovered in this particular model. Uh, a deviation of this uh, standard format of uh, T plus T star is so, you had two things, one is mu and one is lambda and they were related. So, essentially there is one coupling. So, this was a model where you take this super potential and this, sorry, this super potential, this scalar potential and in your HUHD, the Higgs sector of your MSSM, you can get your, yeah. Yeah, so that was a different model now. That phi cube, so you see, here you had a mu and there a lambda phi cube, okay. And then I said that this works when these two are related. So essentially you have one constant. So now I'm moving on to a different model where you have this, this exponential term suppressed by Planck square. So the leading term would be just lambda and then you have higher order Planck squared suppressed terms. And since your HUHD are actually super Planckian, this will make a contribution only during inflation, but not in afterwards, because your HUHD are never super Planckian. So, so here, those two parameters have been reduced to one, albeit with the, I mean, where do you get this? There is no justification, just, uh, this is the one which gives you the correct inflation. There has to be a theory of this particular exponential factor. Just like there, was, there should be a theory why lambda and mu are related and so on. So, this is another sort of uh, model which gives you. So, you don't have enough counter terms to absorb the, because you don't have enough operators, is that right? Hmm? Or, or related coefficient, they are not the same coefficient, but related, 1 by factorial n for a phi to the n, they are not exactly the same. Yeah, but uh, we have really not thought about the, I mean the quantum, I am, I am done actually. Okay, so this is your, uh, if you choose your and beta to be 1, you get this plateau inflation along one direction and this gives you, for this lambda, you get again a very small r. So, in that sense, it is not a very successful model that we were trying to raise this value of r to measurable values, which is not happening. And the last, this thing is that you can do the same, play the same game 
with uh, this Planck suppressed uh, R parity violating term and this is a Polony field which will give you the SUSY breaking and so you can get a consistent model of the SUSY breaking etc and the inflation in this which follows the same group. Okay, so the conclusion of this sector was that uh, following this Ellis's paper of Sugra inflation which is the which is identical to your uh, or analogous to your uh, similar to your Darwinsky model, SUSY can have a usefulness in your uh, inflation even if it is ruled out for the low energy spectrum it still has some good use in the inflation. So, that may be something to see. Okay, thank you. This is a secondary though there is a calculation of the cross section. So, they what they do is they calculate the cross sections which are different. Okay, so one thing I think I, I, you have to keep in mind is this is not just the flux, this is R square times the flux and they are probably doing that to enhance the region where you have a discrepancy. So, this is not exactly the flux, R square is the rigidity. Uh, Which is for the standard model background, the uh, most of the cross sections, or none of the cross sections have been directly measured in the precise region of interest mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, until now. Uh, I didn't comment on this, but, but LHCB can make fixed target measurements, and it very recently made a measurement of uh, anti proton production from protons on helium, mm -hmm. uh, which are uh, uh, very relevant to this range. So, so we're waiting to see how this will be interpreted. But, uh, what's interesting is the measured cross section is, is higher than uh, uh, most of the uh, right. existing tunes. Oh, okay. So then this will go away if, you, if you're what you're saying. I don't know if it will go away, but I'm saying that there's a, a valuable new data coming. Thank you. 